now. So, Christina, there you go. Right. Thanks very much, Luke. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, we can indeed. Um, thanks so much. And uh, thanks to everybody who is uh, attending there online. So, um, and thanks for the invitation to, to speak on this. So I'm going to talk about citizen participation in the design of technology to support independent living and really talk about lessons learned on the next project, which we've been uh, conducting over the last few years. And uh, I'm certainly no expert at all in PPI or, um, so I, I'm, but I'm, I'm going to make this very practical in terms of how we tried to engage um, with people and what we try to do and what we've learned really. So it's, it's uh, I think, a very practical um, session. So the way I've it structured, I'm going to give an overview of the project first, just explain the, the structure of the project um, very briefly. And then I'm going to focus on public and patient involvement, uh, followed by engaging citizens and stakeholders and then reflections and, and future considerations. And I'm not really talking about the technology aspect uh, to any great extent, except just as a as background, so that you know where where I'm coming from in terms of the um, how we try to involve people. <coughs> and I'm imagining I'm going to talk for about uh, 35, 40 minutes, and so hopefully I'll get it all covered in that space of time. Um, okay, so to start with. Uh, the project itself, so it's set really in the context of an aging population. And we know that over the next number of years, our population over 85 years old is going to quadruple by about 2050. And health and social care systems um, are going to, are required to support uh, pre and preserve independence without compromising on quality of life or safety. And we need to, uh, government policy is aimed at supporting older adults to live uh, and remain living at home for as long as possible. And all our healthcare is focused on supporting older adults as well to, uh, to live as independently as possible with supports. So NEXT aims to utilize technology to offer unobtrusive health and wellness monitoring and machine learning to identify and predict changes in the routines of older adults in their home environments. And the project is a collaboration between the DCU Centre for E-Integrated Care, uh, the Insight Centre for Data Analytics, and then there are two industry partners, Davra and Donato. And for this project, we received funding from Enterprise Ireland through the Disruptive Technology Innovation Fund. And the next slide now, I'm going to play a very short video. It's about a minute and a half. And it provides a, just an overview to set the context so you, you have a sense of what I'm talking about um, with the technology. And then I'll go on to explain the different components of the, um, of the project. Sorry, Katrina. Um, rain chance because you play that again, but the audio wasn't working. Do you need to turn the volume up or anything? Oh, okay. Sorry. Yes, there we are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. I didn't see. I didn't see any messages there. Sorry. Is that okay? We shall see. 
Is it okay? Sorry. Katrina, sorry for putting in. You know, when you're sharing your screen, there's a little thing to click if you want the audio to go as well. If sorry. you want to unshare and share again, we can't hear it. Unshare and share again. You when share. you're sharing, if you say share audio, or there's a little button at the bottom of the sharing the video. Oh, okay. Just hold on a second now. Advanced sharing options. Oh, share sound. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good to go again. I'll just go back and... The next project is being developed at DCU with industry partners okay. Davra and Donato as a technology-based system for supporting older adults so that they can live independently in their own homes for as long as possible. To help us ensure that the next system can accomplish this, We've worked with older adults, caregivers and healthcare professionals to help us identify the needs of older adults living at home. Our system consists of different technologies that will work together to support older adults and their caregivers. A voice assistant can help with various day-to-day -day tasks, for example, reminding you to take your medication. You can command it by speaking and the assistant will carry out the commands. Sensors can detect activities and environmental information in your home. Information from these sensors create a picture of your activity and life within your home over short or longer periods of time. Wearable devices collect information on physical activity and sleep and provide feedback to the wearer. Some wearable devices can link with sensors in your home to identify the actions of different people that live there. The next system has the potential to enable older adults to remain living independently at home for longer and to facilitate caregiving support in a non-intrusive manner. If you're interested in participating in the NEXT system trials or would like to find out more, contact NEXT at dcu.ie or call 089-265-3951. Okay, so apologies for that, but hopefully you, you got to hear it in the end. Um, okay, so the project itself then, uh, operated across we we ran it across a, a three-year time frame it started in 2019 uh, up to this year in 2022 and there were three phases to the project the first was a user needs and requirements phase the second was a friendly trial phase and the third an action research trial phase so in the first phase the user needs and requirements this was the our pre-covid 19 plan here was that we would run co-design, uh, we would co-design technology with stakeholders in face-to-face -face workshops. And I suppose we had commenced those when, when COVID hit in March of 2020. Um, and we had to change our methodology there. But so we moved to using an online survey and Zoom workshops to augment what we had already collected in the initial uh, co-design workshops. So overall in that phase of the study, we had 426 participants took part, 62% of them were older adults, 19% were family caregivers and the remaining then were health and social care professionals. And what we did then was we used the information gathered from that phase to inform the next phase, which was the friendly trial and the technology that went into that, the system. So the aim of the friendly trial then was to investigate the technical performance and participant engagement with the system which was developed in response to that initial phase. And the team recruited uh, seven healthy older adults. We uh, included anyone who was aged 60 years and older and living alone. And our participants went up to 87 years. And um, they used the trial, they used the technology in their home for a period of 10 weeks. And the friendly trial was redesigned due to COVID restrictions to involve self-installation of the technology. Um, because at that point we couldn't uh, actually go into people's homes so um, people were required to install the technology so either themselves or family members or somebody in their in their bubble um, and we provided remote technical support for that so that was phase two and then phase three um, 
we then, the final phase then was aimed at refining the system for a larger scale deployment in home environments. And a key objective of the final phase then focused on the use of technology to generate patterns in the data to summarize activities of daily living and longer term behavior patterns within the home. So they were our three overall um, phases. And in that final phase, we recruited 26 older adults for a 10 week trial. Home visits were carried out by researchers and technicians, and we had a very strict uh, COVID protocol to adhere to. Installation in this instance was carried out by technicians and follow-up visits were, were conducted over Zoom. And we're currently analyzing that data from the participant interviews at the end of their experience and when the technology was removed from their home. And we're looking at acceptability and usability of the technology. So to give a sense of, of what we used then, uh, you can see a number of, of um, pieces of technology here. We had a smartwatch which collected information on uh, not just the time on the, on the face, but we had steps and sleep uh, counting available and that was uploaded through an app on a tablet. We had a voice activated assistant which was used for leisure and communication and setting reminders and asking questions. Then we had some smart plugs which monitored electricity use of appliances, things like kettles, microwaves, toasters. And then there were contact sensors placed on doors which would uh, log opening and closing events of, of the door. And, and we used those on drawers as well. And then we used six in one sensors which captured a range of things, including the things we were most interested in were motion, temperature and humidity. And then all of that information was uploaded uh, to the cloud and, and was available on the user interface. So just to give you some idea of what that looks like in a, in a kitchen, uh, this is data coming in from one person's kitchen and you can see there's a timeline across the bottom. I just get the pointer there. Timeline across here. So this person, there, there was no activity showing here in this period uh, up to about nine o'clock in the morning. And then at that stage, you can see that the kettle uh, was used. They opened the fridge a number of times. They opened the press that had cups and plates in it. Um, they opened the cutlery drawer. So you can see different things opening uh, across the time period. You can see the kettle goes off again here later. The toaster is used here. So you can see how the sensors are, are sending information on, on different events. So this was our sensor data and, and smart plug data. And then we had um, information on sleep. Uh, it was collected. A lot of you are familiar with that kind of information coming from your own smartwatches, et cetera and then information on steps. So that's just to give you a sense of, of the kind of information we were collecting. But what I'm going to do now is focus on the, um, on the topic for today, which is really the citizen engagement and, and the PPI focus. So I'll start with uh, the PPI focus. And, and really from the very beginning, um, the user voice was very central to everything we were doing in, in the project. But we planned at the beginning to recruit a PPI um, steering group and and like saying PPI even for me always felt a bit uh, not intuitive here really because it's you know public and patient you know it's not a there were no patients involved in here these were all people who were living at home um, and living alone so it was really engagement of, of uh, citizens so but we planned to have a steering group uh, of stakeholders from the very beginning and we did submit a budget um, for that uh, we had included it so we had things like um, uh, for meetings, we had <coughs> a budget, excuse me, for transport, for parking, for refreshments, for care replacement costs. And interestingly, like this was one that was taken out of the budget. It was rejected by Enterprise Ireland and we had to remove that. But we felt that if carers were coming to meetings and they had to replace themselves with a, a carer, then there was a cost involved for them. But uh, this was this was removed. And uh, we had vouchers for compensation of their time spent at meetings, which were uh, 20 euros per meeting was planned. And we had planned to do about two of these meetings yearly. But you can imagine then, um, as uh, with COVID, we did run into problems. Um, but the PPI steering group, we leveraged our, our contacts with the DCU, the Age Friendly University Network, and people like Family Carers Ireland and HSE contacts and the North Dublin uh, home care organisations to recruit people for the steering group. 
and we were looking for a range of, of uh, stakeholders for this steering group. We wanted older adults, family caregivers, health and social care professionals. We wanted the, the whole range on the steering group. So we advertised um, for this and uh, the panel was established in January of 2020. And uh, we had our first meeting with that panel in, in February of 2022. And we have the, um, just that's a, just a picture of the, the advertising that we used for that uh, PPI panel. So um, then when COVID uh, intervened, uh, we, we were in touch with the panel by email, et cetera, uh, over the uh, summer of 2020. But we attempted to reconvene the, the group again in October of 2020, but motivation really had changed during the course of the project. So the external demands due to COVID, um, you know, for the health and social care professionals was really high and they really didn't have time to devote uh, to this at that stage. And then for in the case of our family carers, in one case, uh, they had had a bereavement and, and couldn't attend. But we did have continued involvement by older adult um, panel members, which was um, really very valuable to us. So just to give an idea of how they contributed then on the project. So I felt, you know, I would feel that they really increased the relevance and the quality of what we produced. So the steering group, they provided input from the very beginning into the co-design workshops and the documentation for the user needs and requirements online survey. So we had to move to that survey pretty quickly and they were, they, their input was very valuable there. And older adult, um, the older adult member then reviewed documents, uh, including trial training manuals as well at a later stage. And uh, all of the panel, the uh, stakeholders, they assisted in participant recruitment for all phases of the study. So we continued to have support from them in terms of recruitment at a later stage. Um, they also helped in dissemination, so um, they reviewed the accessible summary of the user needs and requirements study that was dis uh, disseminated to all of the UNR um, participants, that's all for 26, um, at, you know, once we had that completed, and that's just a, the, the picture of that um, accessible summary that was sent out to participants, um, summarising the, the findings of that initial phase. Now, while we had planned for the PPI steering group, we hadn't actually necessarily plan planned for the ongoing contribution around reviewing documents, uh, etc. for us at a later stage. Um, and this is certainly something that um, we would make sure to include in the budget at a later stage, because um, some people gave quite, quite a significant amount of time to reviewing materials for us. And um, that was uh, really appreciated and really made a difference to us in terms of the the recommendations that they made. Now, apart from the panel, um, there was a whole range of activity around engaging citizens as participants in the, in the project. Um, and so from the very beginning, we were very conscious of needing to build awareness of what we were doing because uh, in order to engage stakeholders, and we knew we'd need quite a number of people across the three years of the study. And um, so from the very beginning, we held meetings with a whole range of groups, including uh, friends of the elderly, uh, older adult community groups, um, and we met them at night and at weekends uh, in, in various locations, uh, family carers. We also met with health and social care uh, organisations, particularly um, Community Health Organisation 9, which is our local area to DCU. We met with primary care team members, we met with nurses and advanced nurse practitioners, we met with physios and occupational therapists working in the community, with private home care support organizations, with rehabilitation teams and with a long-term care facility as well. So we tried to um, uh, engage with as many of the stakeholder groups as possible in terms of um, what, we, what we were doing. Um, now in the first phase, um, the, we conducted the participatory, the co-design workshops. So Open innovation promotes the role of the user to be an active participant in the innovation process from the very beginning and to continue throughout the process. And this was very, um, this was very important to us to make sure that uh, users were very actively participating and that th they were driving the changes and the, the design and what was happening throughout the project. And we had phases built in so that changes could be made based on the feedback that we were receiving. So uh, recruitment for the UNR 
was made through established networks and it was also advertised through churches and local libraries and, and the Northside People newspaper. We were trying to make it as, as accessible as possible so anybody could take part. Friends of the Elderly hosted one of the co-design workshops um, in, in one of their locations and that workshop in fact facilitated access to a, a very uh, frail group, group of older adults um, from the, the research point of view. And then a second co-design workshop was held in DCU just prior to the um, that uh, shutting down in, in, in March. And uh, during those um, workshops, we developed fictitious personas and vignettes to be used to generate ideas for discussion and participants considered solutions and the value technology could add for independent living. Um, and so all of those ideas uh, came together to, 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 to form the basis of the, um, the initial uh, design then that was used in the later stage. And then we shifted to the online survey and to online workshops at the later stage. So going to online then pr provided an opportunity to engage with citizens right across Ireland. And you can see from the map that we had quite a wide uh, engagement uh, from, you know, we, we, we covered quite a lot of the map in terms of, of people taking part in the online survey. And the DCU, the Age Friendly University, um, was a, a valuable resource for linking with potential participants and reading, reaching a wider network. And I think that um, this is a, an undervalued resource within the university because it, is, it was fantastic for us. And the local councils were also fantastic. Um, they have, uh, every council in the country has an age friendly uh, unit and they have an age friendly panel. And so they sent out, um, they distributed the um, emails with the uh, online survey for us. And in fact, recruitment at every stage of the project exceeded our expectations. And I think a lot of the engagement we, we did with, with groups um, across the stakeholder um, uh, groupings really helped with that. So I think that, that made life uh, easier as well. Um, there's a few things I wanted to, to bring up here in terms of, you know, engaging, particularly with this, um, this group that, that we were particularly interested in. And I know everyone is, is, is working with different groups, but ageist imagery and media com communication uh, for the project was, was a real concern for us. Um, because if you just think about a lot of the imagery you see of older adults uh, in newspapers and media communications, et cetera, you see um, very dependent, uh, uh, very negative imagery, very dark, a lot of withered hands, et cetera. So we spent a bit of time uh, discussing this and uh, ensuring that this was addressed in, in all of the communications that we sent out. So we reviewed images and we wanted to make sure that our uh, the images that we were using as part of the project, uh, you know, used appropriate imagery, including gender and ethnic diversity. And the, the team purchased images to address this issue. Um, we found it quite hard to get um, images uh, freely. And the positive, we did actually receive positive feedback on the images used in recruitment material. And this was commented on by participants in, in the process evaluation interviews. And it was uh, appreciated and it, it, it sparked interest in the project as well. And um, so just to give you an example, that's one of the images that we purchased and, and we would have used. Um, and then there's another one uh, that was on one of the advertising leaflets for the, um, the initial workshops. Another issue then, um, transparency regarding citizen involvement. So we wanted to make sure that people who were getting involved had a, a, an overview of what we were trying to achieve. And uh, so that short video that you saw at the beginning um, was produced and uh, to provide an overview of the technologies involved in the trial and to give people a sense if they were interested in taking part, they could see this. And then, you know, some people at that point said, no, I'm out or I'm, I'm in. Um, but it gave people an opportunity to see what was ahead. And this was used for community-based uh, recruitment and also for subsequent presentations like this. So, but it did actually require a significant amount of research or time uh, was spent in planning and scripting and reviewing the video um, with, the pri with the company that was employed to produce it. Um, and that included things like, you know, listening to different voices and 
choosing the voice to go with it, etc. And all of the different components that went into uh, scripting that. But it was time very well spent and it has proved to be a really valuable resource and um, something that I would very definitely uh, consider doing again for, for any subsequent projects. Now, um, because we were going into people's homes, then it was really important for us that we would build rapport and trust with the um, participants and the people who were taking part. Um, now, as nurses, most of us are very familiar with the context and would have been very familiar with um, uh, working with older adults at home, etc. But it is very worthwhile thinking about your staff and who is part of a project and um, and just stopping to think about their engagement with people because for them it might be new territory. So it was, um, I think it was important to establish protocols for all staff, both ourselves and for the industry partners. Simple things like arranging appointments by email and respecting people's time. Um, you know, a lot of the, the old adults who took part in the, in the trials with us, they were very busy, they had lots going on. And, you know, if somebody had said they were coming at a certain time and they didn't appear at that time, you know, that wasn't acceptable from our point of view. So we needed to make sure that all of that was, you know, clear and unambiguous and that we were all operating off the same principles there. And um, there also needs to be an awareness of the diversity of older adults experience and ability to use technology. So some were highly skilled and um, very experienced users and others were very novel users. So we had to be able to um, address uh, the needs right across that spectrum. Um, remaining in view really relates to when we were in people's houses. So uh, if you can imagine a researcher and a technician in a house, there's a lot of technology going in. There's a lot of new things happening um, and a lot of discussion about where things are being placed and um, doing assessments in the home. Then it is very important that the researchers and the technicians stayed in view of the person all the time. So we weren't in different rooms doing different things. And also that there were people present when somebody was going upstairs or entering bedrooms, that there was at least two people um, involved and two people there with the, with the participant as well. And things like, you know, simple things like removing all the waste when you're leaving a house. You know, there was a lot of boxes and packaging and all of the rest. So all of that was quite important. And, I think showing respect and, and uh, being very conscious that you're in people's homes and how you need to engage with people. Um, for, some, for some people that is, it's understood, but for some people that might, might not be so clearly understood. So something like that, uh, I think really important in, in terms of the project. There was also scaffolding uh, required for continued engagement. So, um, we provided training in the home at the time that the, the technology went into the house. We also provided hard copy of training manuals, which were quite detailed um, so that people had a chance to, to read those in advance. And then they, they had those later on for themselves as well. Um, we also provided some training videos uh, to, for each individual component that was in a person's house. So that, and they, they were emailed so that people could review those after the training if they wanted. And they also had the opportunity to talk to researchers um, the uh, researchers and the technicians were available um, by email or phone for any questions. I've said researchers and participants there. Um, I mean, researchers and technicians. So as a team as well, then we needed to be very responsive to the feedback we were receiving. So um, in the first phase, the, the findings were extensively discussed with the um, the technology partners and the design uh, was built on, on that. Then we had a phase at the end of the friendly trial where the people who had taken part uh, took part in a process evaluation. And we and, and they talked about the things really that they, they liked and they didn't like and that were successful and etc. So um, self-installation was absolutely not a runner at all um, that was came across very strongly at the, the friendly trial phase that you know for the next phase we needed to go back to techn technician technicians installing the technology and um, the self-installation caused a lot of stress and people didn't like it and it was very time consuming the smartwatch we used in the first um, in the friendly trial was also not um, 
evaluated well. And so we changed that uh, for the next round. Now, concerns were expressed. We had a, the, the six in one sensor that we used, uh, which captured temperature and humidity, et cetera. That was, that would flash when you passed by it to, when it was detecting motion, it would, it would flash. And um, this caused, even though people knew that we weren't using cameras and that was all explained um, very clearly at the beginning, the flashing of the sensors, people felt that it was something taking a picture of them. Um, so, and even though they knew it was, there, there wasn't a camera there, but this actually, uh, we changed up some of our training materials and how we did the training on that piece of equipment for the next round. So in the next round in the ARC trial, we took off the back of the sensors and we showed people that the, um, you know, there was batteries installed and that's why it was a chunky piece of equipment as opposed to something that had a camera. So just to reassure people and make sure that people were comfortable with that and that they knew that we were trying to make sure that everything was very clearly understood. The length of the training manual was, was identified as a problem. It was too long. So we, we tried to address that in the, the later phases as well. And there were privacy concerns uh, raised in the friendly trial about the apps that were used on personal devices. So things like uh, an Alexa, uh, an Amazon account was required and an Alexa app for using the voice activated assistant. So the, the, the need for those was removed in the, in the final phase and we used um, uh, apps on uh, project tablets uh, to, to, um, to facilitate that. So we try to be uh, responsive in terms of um, what people were, were uh, coming back to us with. So in terms of reflections and uh, future considerations, I think the important thing is to really, uh, in terms of uh, engagement is to start somewhere and, and just make a start. And I think we started by having the, um, the PPI steering panel and um, but we had quite deep engagement with citizens right throughout the project in terms of listening to their voice as participants. Um, what the appropriate level of participation is really depends on, on what the project is, but we would certainly aim to embed PPI much earlier in the research process in the future, and we've already started to conduct some workshops with older adult groups and service providers, um, and we've planned some meetings with uh, family carers as well um, to explore further work in this area and how we can develop out the, um, the system. Now, one thing I would say is that maintaining a PPI panel across a number of years is definitely a challenge. And um, I think if doing this again in the future, I would consider ways to address this in terms of um, maybe over recruitment and backfilling places or having a role in the panel, something that will allow engagement over a, a longer period of time. Just watch my time here now. Um, other things, um, that we would feel would be important is that you would develop and maintain links with stakeholder groups uh, that may have an interest in PPI and link up with members who've already completed the PPI induction days facilitated by PPI Ignite. So uh, uh, we've already met with uh, Age and Opportunity and some of their uh, participants have, um, some of their members have already uh, attended those days. So they would be a really interesting group. They're, they've already done those induction days and they would be uh, very useful to link up with in the future for um, uh, for future projects. Um, my next point really is that while costs for the PPI participants may be acknowledged and included in budgets and are considered, I think that more consideration is required for the time costs to the research team in terms of time spent maintaining relationships with all stakeholders and going out to try and form, form those relationships. And th so that is quite time consuming. And I guess we're involved in quite a bit of that at the moment. And there's no, it's at an early stage for a future project, but there's no, um, there is no real funding for something like that. And also to be prepared for variation in funders understanding of PPI and their desire to trim your budget um, and have a robust defense ready for that. So, um, you know, it was interesting to us that while if we were submitting to somebody like the Health Research Board, they would be very um, amenable uh, to uh, putting in budget for to replace carers, but somewhere like Enterprise Ireland um, weren't going to consider that. And in fact, 
they pushed back all the time on the um, on the compensation for participants time etc and um so building on our experience from next uh, we've already used the experience we've gained in um, we had a submission for the hrb for the secondary data analysis projects so we submitted a grant for that recently it wasn't funded but the ppi aspect of that application was strongly endorsed by the reviewers which was was great to see and we've linked with um, the ppi ignite team to generate further ideas on how to integrate it into our future research and how to budget for that um, and but small scale funding is required for early engagement with citizens and stakeholders to generate ideas um, and i think that needs to be flexible and available throughout the year because it doesn't always fit neatly with um, the time scales that um, for the for grant applications and sharing our experience, I think, is is important as well. And, and this is part of, of that process. Another way that we are reaching out and, and trying to engage people is through uh, teaching. And we've developed a, a digital learning object based on the uh, on the experience of NEXT. And so we're expanding uh, dissemination of the research through integration into the, the content, uh, into the curriculum. And we've, we're using that um, digital learning object on the undergraduate nursing, the digital spiral curriculum and on the postgraduate programs. Um, so a, a nice way to get the information out to a, a whole other uh, group of people. And then probably our most successful um, thing in terms of engagement is our uh, DCU next, our living lab. So we have a facility on the first floor of the nursing building where we have a, it's like a little uh, bed sitter community flat. And we've installed all the technology from the project in there. And so we can use that as a, as a demonstrator and people can come and visit that. So we have hosted groups in, since the summer in, in that space. We've had uh, the Dublin Learning Cities Festival, which was organised by uh, DCU Age Friendly, um, have visited there. So we've had uh, groups of older adults and then uh, Age and Opportunity have brought a group to visit. The National Disability Authority have, have recently made a visit and the HSE Primary Care Network Managers from the North Dublin area and the Advanced Nurse Practitioners for Older Adults and um, in the North Dublin area have all also come to visit that. So that's a really useful tool to engage um, uh, stakeholders across the spectrum uh, in terms of the kind of work that we're doing. And um, to and it's it's very it's the very uh, practical nature of it and the fact that people can come and they can see and they they really understand when they come and see it what what we've been trying to do. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to say just to finish is that um, some of you may be familiar with this, but uh, others may not. But there is a checklist for reporting of PPI. There is a longer grip one. It's, it's a longer form where PPI is the main focus, but there is a shorter one where PPI is the secondary focus of the research project, uh, the reference for it there. And um, it, it gives you the um, a template for um, how to include it in, in reporting. So that may be useful um, for some people on the project. So I think that's really what I have to say. It's I tried to make it very practical to some of the things that came up for us as issues as we went along and um, how we how we included the the user and tried to um, listen to that voice all the way through and embed it from one phase into the next and um, and provide them with feedback as well as we went along. And um, and how we uh, worked with the stakeholder group at the beginning as well. So I think that's maybe enough of um, enough of me talking. And maybe there are some questions starting to arise there. Thank you very much, Katrina. That was excellent. Uh, very informative. Um, yeah, really excellent project. Uh, yeah, just to reiterate, I put it in the chat, but if anyone has any questions, you can ask them directly to Katrina or you can put it in the chat box. Uh, but uh, we have a question already uh, from Dace Dace. I'm sorry, I pronounced your name wrong. Can the technology be used to provide independent living also for people with physical disabilities? Uh, and is it possible to use voice technology if speech of a user is not clear? Yeah, that's... Um... 
thanks very much. That's the very uh, interesting and pertinent questions. Um, they certainly could be used for people with uh, disability and we are currently in discussion with um, St. Michael's House around uh, how this might be used for a group with intellectual disability and we in fact have a group of uh, service users with disability who live alone in the community actually planning a visit to our lab so they're, they're, um, they're going to come in and have a look and see um, what they think of it and we would hope to generate some ideas from that and then your second question around the voice um, that was something we expected to be possibly a bigger issue than it was but most people in their feedback on the voice activated assistant didn't actually have a problem with that um, a few people did but it wasn't as big an issue as we were anticipating now that could be just the group of users that we had, but um, it certainly didn't didn't appear to be as big an issue as it comes across in the literature. I hope that answers that. No, no excellent answer. Uh, another question just came in: uh, Did any of your trial, sorry, did any of your trial older people have cognitive impairments or dementia, etc.? And were there any in the age group of 85 years or older? Uh, yeah. Were any of them already being supported by carers coming into the house, etc.? Were the people early adopters of innovation, or did you have, or did you have any who were reluctant to engage? So that's a long question there, Katrina. It's in the box if you want to have a quick look there's, at it. Yeah, there's quite a few there. From the point of view of cognitive impairment, um, we um, we had a screening at the beginning uh, for um, cognitive impairment. We had to ensure that people take part because we were testing, a ve we were at a very early stage of testing. Um, we decided to uh, adopt that strategy, but uh, Given what we know now, we would be keen to include people with early cognitive impairment for future rounds. And in fact, in discussion with both the older adults and uh, a range of caregivers, there seems to be quite a bit of appetite for um, use of this kind of technology for people who have mild cognitive impairment um, and have capacity to consent for future use and that it might be very useful um, that people could be exposed to it at an early stage, consent to it at that point, and then you would have that consent for a later stage when um, greater problems uh, arise. So there is quite a lot of interest in that space. Um, in terms of the age group, the oldest person we had was 87 years old. Um, some people were entirely living alone with no supports and other people had uh, family support coming in. Um, we didn't uh, require any kind of support as part of the um, the eligibility criteria and uh, people just had to be living alone at home. And um, there was another element to that question. I can't remember what the third piece was. Is there another piece? Um, um, the cognitive the impairment, the age, and were they early adopters? Um, interestingly, some people had very little experience and then other people uh, would be what you would consider early adopters. Yeah. And some people were very experienced, but we, we had really quite a range. Um, there were some people who, um, you know, had experienced a lot of difficulty, for example, with um, charging the watches, uh, just putting in the charging cable. So we had we had a whole range um, and. Uh, so we didn't we didn't exclude any anybody on that basis. Excellent. Any more questions anyone would like to ask directly to Katrina? If not, I do have a question of my own. Go Katrina, ahead, I was soldiers. just oh, yeah. uh, wondering, sorry now if I missed this, because I've never heard, I've learned so much. Uh, and it's brilliant uh, description of the project as well as the, the engaged part of it. Um, a friendly trial. Um, I hadn't come across that before. 
So interesting. I know it's not directly related, so we can, you know, it's just really interesting. It's, it's, I think really in another context, you would just call it a pilot. Mm. Um, but it was the, I think maybe that's used more in the technology space. Um, and maybe even using the word friendly trial made it sound a little bit more friendly as well. Um, and people were very aware that that was, um, you know, we were trying things out at that stage. One thing I didn't mention actually, which was, which did cause us a bit of problems in the, in the main trial was that, you know, things that we thought were fine in the friendly trial and we'd no problems with, we had problems with. So for example, um, the sensors we were using, everything was fine during the friendly trial. But when we got to the main trial, a batch of the sensors we were using had very poor adhesive on them. So they, you know, for a couple of participants, they all fell off within like an hour or two of being put up. So that, you know, that created a whole range of, of problems. Um, but that was just a technology related glitch, but more due to a particular batch, you know. Um, so, but something like that could destroy trust in, in what you're doing. Um, if you, you see technology coming in and it's starting to fall off the minute you put it up, you know. Um, so we had to work, we worked very closely with participants to make sure that, um, you know, they, they knew exactly what we were doing all the time. And, you know, if there were issues that we were explaining what the issues were, yeah. Sorry, was there another question, Luke? Did I miss a question? No, no, that was great. I said I had one, but I'm opening the floor to other people first. Uh, you always have a, Anne has said, yeah, your point about the images and how you manage that was uh, so important. I agree with Anne there. Um, or I'm going to ask a, just a quick question, and this is about kind of uh, your interactions with your participants. Um, and at the centre, we we talk a lot about uh, co-creation. So the researcher and the participants being on more of an equal footing when talking about the project and moving forward. So I was just wondering uh, if you can remember, were there any points within the project where the input of your participants um, really cast a new light on something that you guys had been looking at or maybe that you hadn't considered. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about that, if you can remember. Yeah, well, well, actually straight up, um, the, you know, so in, in advance, there would have been a range of options in terms of technology that could potentially be used. Um, but the, the interest by the older adults themselves in the voice activated technology was much higher than we expected. And um, they were very keen and they were very keen for their own ends in terms of leisure pursuits, interests, etc. cetera. Um, and it was really, you know, so when, when we got onto the monitoring, you find that a lot of the caregivers are very interested in the monitoring, but the older adults themselves you know, the monitoring themselves, you know, some of them would have said afterwards, well, I know what I'm doing. I know when I'm boiling the kettle, so I don't need that information. But I can see how that information would be useful if I was, you know, if I was very frail in the future and somebody was was keeping an eye on me. They use this term, the keeping an eye on me a lot. Um, but for themselves, they felt that the voice activated assistant was very useful. Um, the problem that arose with the use of voice activated assistance is that with the other pieces of technology you can close you can close the edges I guess and um, where it's a closed system whereas with the voice activated if you really want to get the full value out of the voice activated you need to use it it you know you need to be linked to google or to amazon or whatever it is so that you know if there is a voice if there is a music streaming service and you want music you have that access to do that you have full access to all of those facilities and really to get the best value you nearly need to be uploading your contact list from your phone and then you can do face to face phone calls voice activated phone calls but people loved that some of the features you know we had one man who was a, a big um uh, jazz music enthusiast and he used to spend a lot of time he said twiddling dials on radios looking for uh, jazz music uh, stations around the world and he loved the fact that he could access them voice activated you know once he was he was on on the um the voice activated assistant other people found things like the um you know the recipes different recipes for bacon scones or whatever um and the questions, and there was a really nice intergenerational piece as well, where 
um, quite a few people said like their grandchildren loved coming in because they had this voice activated assistant. The grandchildren were asking all kinds of funny questions and um, asking Alexa, would she would she marry them and things like this? You know, so they they loved the interaction with the children as well. And the children seeing them using technology as well was was quite a, an important thing for some people. Um, and then, of course, there were people who didn't like it at all, who said, no, I'd never use one of them. Um, but certainly the um, the interest in the voice activated assistant, it was something very much for themselves and for their own pleasure. That So that pleasurable piece um, was very important, yeah. Excellent, that's a great story, asking Alexa to marry her. Yeah. <laughs> no, very interesting. And she, I can't remember what it was, but she said something, she said something like she had a lot of invitations or, you know, there was some very funny response as well, yeah. Uh, if there's any other questions, you can um, you can fire ahead and ask them to Katrina directly, or you can put them in the chat box. Um, okay, it looks like we're going to close. I have I have one more, but um, yeah, on on, on, the, on the the project, but maybe a slightly different topic. I was just wondering in terms of the. The keeping an eye on your on your subjects and um, these technologies was there kind of GDPR issues or when you talk about data collection and um, even going forward if this is going to inform policy and different things um, do you have to have a or did you have a, like a serious conversation with your sub with the community groups that you worked with about that? Yeah, so so this has come up. Um, this comes up every time this is talked about so the privacy issues in the in the user needs and requirements study the privacy issues were very important to people and um, during this um develop these development phases the um the interface was only available to us so if there were no carers actually looking at any of this data so we had all of that um covered in terms of gdpr and our data protection our impact assessment um, but in the future, this would be an issue and it would be something where consent would be required to ensure that only particular people had access. And um, it was interesting in the user needs and requirements as well, like some of the older adults said they would be very happy to share this kind of information with their family. Um, others felt no, it would be burdensome on families and they wouldn't like it, And but they would be very happy for a third person to have access, like a third person monitoring station, for example. Um, we did have, um, as part of the trial in the in the, the ARC phase, we did try um, system generated alerts that could be individualized to individual people. So for example, if your front door opened between midnight and 6 a.m., a text alert could be sent. Um, and we generated those text alerts to our project phone uh, just to demonstrate that they could work or if the kettle wasn't boiled by you know between 6 a.m and 10 a.m you know somebody might know oh there's definitely something wrong my mother hasn't you know she's not up she hasn't boiled the kettle if she does that every morning so you could you could put in particular rules that are focused on individual people's habits and routines but you'd need to know what they were so there's a really very individualized component here that um, not only informs where the sensors go, but also informs what you do with that information. Yeah. Yeah, no, excellent. All right, if, if there are no additional questions, we can start uh, wrapping this up. Um, um, could I just ask a question? Um, of course. Sorry. Bit late, but um, I just wanted to follow on from the GDPR question you asked there. Look, um, the HRR is that does that um, affect the research on how you can use that data? So if you're using a phone that's collecting um or the sensory um devices, does that like can can research can re can it be used in research um with true explicit consent or? I just wanted sort of a wee bit more information on that. Can you can you say that again? What what piece are you asking? I'm not sure what you're asking. 
So in terms of the devices, the, the technology, um, and in terms in terms of the um, the GDPR, the, the the rules that govern how you use the information that's collected. Yeah. Can you how much can you use that within the research that you're doing? Like can doctors or can can outside parties actually access that information? So if there is a phone that's collecting steps or heartbeats or you know, can that be used in wider research projects if there is explicit consent given? Yeah, so in so in the in the situation where we were for this particular project, that yeah. information was just coming to us. And we had a full um, graphic available to the participants where they could see where their information was going. So we knew who they were and where they lived. And the technology partners who were involved in the installation knew who they were and where they lived. But once that information from the sensors was went to the cloud and went on to the um, for, for data analysis, those companies and the, the researchers involved there, they only knew them as a participant number. They had no further information on the individuals themselves. So only ourselves as the, as the research team directly involved with the participants and the technicians who were providing the service in their home knew who they were. And other than those two, um, they were always um, referred to by a, um, a research number and none of that information was available to anybody else but but it would be the kind of what we would see in the future is that uh, where consent would be where they would provide consent that particular individuals could be given that information so that a, a report could be generated based on their activities so we did quite a bit of work that I didn't really refer to here on the on summarizing activities of daily living. And what we're now looking at is standardized um, metrics of, of activities of daily living that could be used by an integrated care team, for example, or a GP could see, okay, th these are the things they're doing on a regular basis, or, um, or, or people could use, say, their steps with the, in conjunction with their physio or a physio program, for example, or the OT can see what they're doing around the kitchen, just as examples. Um, and if somebody gave consent for that to be uh, transferred to a particular team, then that could be done. But it wasn't done as part of the research that wasn't done. It was it was all held by us. OK, thank you. And just um, a follow up on that. Is that quite challenging? Because you always are collecting a lot of data that could be used um, in, in wider research projects and then there's yourselves. Um, doing next and then there's Tilda I believe which is doing a sort of a similar program but it's it's quite health healthcare related and then there's the one in Maynooth which is doing age friendly yeah you are actually like doing very similar projects but then you can't really share the information in a wider research sort of a remit so obviously there's a lot of is is there a lot of challenges in that respect? There, there definitely would, but but in terms of say the data analysis that's done on the um on generating the activities of daily living and on the, the patterns of activity, that can be shown like the, that that can be shown and can be shared. Um so that's some of that work, but it, it doesn't require us to to release any of the of the participant information. So we wouldn't release participant information, but the, the process in terms of generating that can be released and can be made accessible and, and through open source journals. Yeah. OK, so right. it, but there, there is there is definitely a lot of um, there is overlap and there's different technologies used for. But the, I, I think that the importance of of uh, standardization and interoperability of what's collected is is what will come to the fore much more in the future because we need to whatever information we're collecting using this system we should be able to provide that information in a in a in a way that's understandable to uh, different systems that that people are operating yeah okay thank you <laughs> not at all you're welcome rosemary Any other? Yes. Any, any last any last words from anyone? Any questions? If not, I think we'll we'll wrap this up. That's great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much, Luke, for that.
And thank you. Thank you very and much. And if anyone Angela. has any questions, further questions or queries there, um, I'd be happy to take them by email as well. Yes. So we Katrina dot Murphy at DCU. Uh, dot IE. So thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, in two weeks, we will have the DCU Adapt Centre come to talk to us about uh, our interactions with AI. And we, you're all welcome to join us for that as well. But uh, thank you again, Katrina. And uh, this is Not the end. Talk.